The views and opinions expressed on this show do not reflect that of the staff and management of WNOV and W293CX 106.5 FM Courier Communications Milwaukee, but are the sole comments of the host and guest of this particular show. The views and opinions expressed in this program do not reflect those of Wisconsin Voices. The views and opinions expressed by hosts and guests are their own, and their appearance on the program do not imply any endorsement or representation by Wisconsin Voices. Thank you for listening to Be a Voice with Wisconsin Voices. Be a voice. 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 Visit WisconsinVoices.org. Visit WisconsinVoices.org. Visit WisconsinVoices.org. And learn more on how to be a voice with Wisconsin Voices. Early voting, if you don't think you're going to be able to make it during the the week, I mean, the day of Election Day, which is April 2nd, please get out there and vote now. Um, Let's start with our candidates. We have... Possibly three today. We're going to do, uh, if you have any questions, comments, you can call 414-444-5250. And candidate, introduce yourself. <laughs> well, uh, hi, Tamika. Thank you so much for having me on. My name is Bill Christensen. I am currently serving as the deputy comptroller for the city of Milwaukee, and I'm running for the position of comptroller for the city of Milwaukee. So we're having, um, we'd, we're having every you know, at least one or two people from every uh, uh, position that want to run. We've gotten a really good feedback from people and, and they have been on the show. I, If you've listened to my show, you will know what the next question is. So I'm going to give you the next question. What does the comptroller do? Well, uh, since I've been campaigning, I answer that question at least 20 times a day. So I'm happy to answer. It but some people here. come, I've seen people come in here and still don't know their campaign and they still don't know what their job is. Sure. So <laughs> we we, we want to make sure uh, what is, in your opinion, and what statute, whatever, however you want to answer, sure. what does a con- comptroller do? So the comptroller's office is essentially, amongst other things, the central hub of all financial transactions that take place within the city. So um, the comptroller sets accounting policy and sets financial policy. The comptroller audits city finances and city operations. So looking for fraud, waste, and abuse, and also looking for efficiencies, ensuring that uh, taxpayer dollars are being used efficiently and programs are operating effectively. Uh, the comptroller is uh, in charge of payroll, so managing payroll, so making sure that the thousands of staff that are employed by the city are paid accurately and on time. Uh, the comptroller manages the city's debt profile, so the, uh, sells bonds on behalf of the city. And uh, the city's debt pro- profile is, is over $1 billion. So, I mean, okay. the, the stakes we're talking about are, are incredibly high. So we manage uh, relationships with investors, with bond rating agencies who essentially give the city a, a credit score. They call it the bond rating. That's essentially the city's credit score. And the better our bond rating is, the lower our interest rate is. And that is super rate. important sure. for that. Um, a lot of times you have to get your audit in in time to get a decent bond rating. You can't be two, three years behind on your audit to get a decent bond rating. So those are the the things that are super important, that's that's money saved by taxpayers. Yes. And um, so the, the city has, due to its kind of structural budget challenges, the financial challenges that we've been facing over the last number of years, uh, has experienced a couple of bond rating downgrades. So that has led to um, increases in the cost of our borrowing relative to if we had stayed at where we were or even improved our bond rate. Um, with the passage of Act 12, which was uh, legislation that, uh, amongst other things, gave the city the ability to enact a 2% city-only sales tax, also came with um, a one-time increase in shared revenue, as well as structural ongoing increases in shared revenue, which is essentially a transfer payment from the state that was kept flat for over 20 years. So I think that, and then um, the... um, 
addressing the the pension problem. So the the, the city's pension problem, which had experienced some some shortcomings, uh, shortfalls in terms of our unfunded liability. Um, the Act 12 closed, soft close the pension plan. So somebody like me that's been with the city since 2010, I'll still be with the city's pension plan. But somebody that starts with the city as of January 1st, 2024, they're on the state's plan. So those, those three things, the sales tax, shared revenue, and addressing the pension problem, uh, that has at least stabilized our, uh, our position um, in terms of our bond rating. And we've been taken off of negative outlook by the bond rating agencies. So we're, we're not imminently facing another downgrade, but I, I think like you mentioned, um, you know, they, they want to see years of an improved financial situation and they want to see it in our audited financial statements, not just, you know, we can, I can describe to you what act 12 did financially and talk about the benefits that it'll bring to the city. But I think in, until it's actually, um, you know, showing in our audited financial statements, the, the rating agencies are going to be a little reluctant to upgrade. It has to be implemented. And, and even in your job, and, and let me be clear, uh, the, the job of the control comptroller is take those funds. Like there was specific things that were supposed to be done with this 2% increase. And your job is to make sure that those 2%, it, the, the monies go to what they specifically asked for, which was, I think, um, to do the uh, retire, I mean, help with the retirement um, system. What were the things again? Yeah, so uh, up to 90% of those funds can be spent to pay down the city's unfunded pension liability. And uh, the rest goes towards increasing our sworn strength for uh, police and fire up to prescribed levels. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think our office is going to be involved in that, but I do think it is a, a citywide effort. I, I think that the city is, is together on this. I mean, I think there's a recognition of, you know, look more, uh, addressing our pension problem. That's the responsible right thing to do from a short term and a long term perspective. And, um, you know, improving public safety, I think is something that's in, in all of our interests. So yes, the comptroller's office plays a role, but I do think it is, um, citywide and it's, it's a citywide effort. And when I say, so I want to make sure that people understand and that there's, it's a wraparound kind of um, allocation of this. When the mayor comes in, he comes in with a budget. He gives his budget to the Common Council. The Common Council then looks at the budget, does adjustments, whatever they, they feel they need to do, and then they'll pass the budget. And they allocate monies. Now, what the comptroller does is also looks at what that budget is, making sure that they're allocated to the right um, right departments and that there's oversight, per se. That is a simplistic, I think, view of how this is a wraparound way. So when you're, you're voting for your mayor, when you're voting for your alder person, when you're voting for your comptroller, when you're voting for your treasurer, all these th people have to work together in a, like a, a holistic uh, view. 414-444-5250. Uh, if you have any questions for Bill Christensen. Bill, let's talk a little bit about you and your background. Mm -hmm. um, we want to know who you are as well. I mean, there is, um, like, give us you. Like, if you had to, not as a candidate, but just who you are. I mean, sure. who's Bill? Sure. So um, I grew up on the southwest side of Milwaukee. I am the the son of an MPS teacher and a Milwaukee firefighter. Um, she was a firefighter. No, just <laughs> no, 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 no. My mom, she taught first grade over at Fairview Elementary. And, and my dad uh, retired as a, as a deputy chief with the Milwaukee Fire Department. Um, I went to uh, St. Greg's, which is a grade school on the southwest side, 60th in Oklahoma. You may know them for their church festival. Festival. Yes. <laughs> which sadly is no longer taking place anymore. They could not find volunteers to, to do the church festival again, which is unfortunate. But um, and then I went to uh, Pius for high school where um, I, I ran track and I played football. And um, then I went no to basketball as tall as you are. So basketball is very competitive or was very competitive <laughs> at Pius. And so there were 75, I think, kids that came out for the freshman team. 
And they had to come up with an arbitrary cutoff for who was and wasn't going to even have the chance to like try out for the team. And you had to do an off-handed layup. So for me, it was a left-handed layup with the right footwork. And I just, for the life of me, <laughs> couldn't do it. I still can. I struggle with that too. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I didn't make that, but I played uh, intramural. Um, so I played, I, I still kept up. And I still actually So played. you got a participant award. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A ribbon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, what is your like college background, I guess, because of, of what you did sure. in regards to that as well. And then we'll get into your, your, um, well, we'll do that and then we'll. Sure. So, uh, my, my undergraduate degree, um, I, I went to UW Oshkosh and, uh, That's where my dad oh, a Titan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I really enjoyed my time up there. Uh, I met a lot of great people. In fact, a lot of the, the people who were on my floor in, in the dorm freshman year are still my friends to this day. So I mean, it was, it was a great experience. And, uh, after Oshkosh, I went to UW Milwaukee for, uh, my master's degree where I, I got my master's in public administration. So there were some, there was some finance focus, but it was really more policy focused. My favorite class that I took there was, uh, policy analysis. Had a professor, Mordecai Lee, and I remember the first day of class. It's like, there's two words that you can't use in my class. What are these two words going to be? It was community and resources. Because those are just too vague. It says community. Well, who are we talking about here? What community? Resource. Are we talking financial resources? What financial resources? Human resource, people, power, what is there in? Right. And I, and I like that because I, I, I like you know, defining things. I don't like to use this like very broad political. I might have to steal that because we do community based stuff. So um, let's take that uh, at first. Caller. Caller, go ahead. Good morning to you all. Thank you for taking my call. Good uh, morning. Mr. Go ahead. Hey, ma'am. You're Mr. Christensen. Um, obviously, some of your uh, uh, mailing, or is that how you would it? And Liz, you know, he's mailing list. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. And Mr. Glock, I think that's how you can walk in. Uh -huh. And I noticed uh, the, uh, the mailer that you make a distinction between yourself and himself or with regards to Scott Walker. And I think that um, Milwaukee suffered generationally by uh, having a governor like uh, Scott Walker. And I think Paul. Uh, Especially when it comes to well, uh, not, the the uh, regeneration of life uh, regarding uh, manufacturing over at the old A.L. Smith site where they had Talgo, I saw the I saw the train there, and I think that when Scott Walker uh, didn't accept the assistance from the federal government, I think that contributed to the waywardness. Oh, uh, the inner city, and I think that that uh, contributed to the manifestation of the Kia boys. People like uh, the Angler, uh endeavored to partake in those type of uh, and that type of behavior. And since you made that distinction between yourself and Mr. Ross, um, concerning Paul Walker, I wanted to you to, and I'll, you got my vote, that's my vote for you, but I wanted you to. And expound on uh, what do you think, if you think at all, if anything, did uh, the uh, exclusion or of uh, acceptance of the funds from the federal government to uh, regenerate manufacturing for you over there in, on the north side, how uh, did it contribute to uh, what we see in the streets of Milwaukee? And I don't know if this impacts your uh, role as uh, the controller. Uh, knowing that that man, what's the Skywalker? I love me. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think to, speaking to um, you know, the the piece, uh, I really wanted to draw a comparison between between myself and my opponent. As um, look, I, I'm a public finance professional. I've been in the office. I've been the the deputy comptroller. Uh, I, I've been a 14 year public finance. Professional. 
all with the city of Milwaukee. Um, I'm a certified public finance officer. I want to draw a distinction between myself and my opponent as the, um, the experienced candidate who can step in on day one and, and get the job done. Um, and I was speaking to, um, mentioning, um, Mr. Walker, and in terms of missed opportunities with ep economic development, I do think that there was a, a missed opportunity there with the um, the option, the declining the option to expand uh, rail service in Wisconsin. And as far as the, the impact that that could or couldn't have had on city of Milwaukee residents, I mean, that's that's getting something that I, I don't want to weigh in on something that I'm not a, an expert in, and it's really outside of my my area of expertise. But I, I do, uh, I would agree that it was a, a missed opportunity, I think, for the city and the region. Bill, is there a way, if, when, is there a way that people can um, apply for the appointment? Uh, I would encourage people to get in touch with me. And uh, I mean, I, I can be, I am accessible um so I, it would be there's not going to be a formal announcement that's going to come out of the city that's because this is an appointed position as opposed to um you know something that will go through the normal civil service process right catch wisconsin voices Pia Voice Radio every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday at 11 a.m. as we focus on community partnerships, voter education, and long-term collective impact for all Wisconsinites. You're listening to Wisconsin Voices, BA Voice Radio. Follow us at BAWI Voice and learn more at WisconsinVoices.org. Wisconsin Voices, three pillars, protecting democracy, teaching advocacy, building community. Say your first name again. Rehenio Bull. Well, Rehenio. Rehenio. Rehenio, yeah. Um, and, and I wanted to strictly let you know, people know that because they see that name and they don't necessarily know. But when you say Ray Nitty, oh, I know that person. So I guess uh, I, what made you, well, let me, we'll ask at a different time. But I'm going to ask you my question. What? does an alderman do uh to me an alderman is a liaison for constituents that they represent and they're supposed to listen to the needs of the people in the community residents business owners as well and based on that whether that's potholes uh parking issues uh trash issues not being picked up but uh they're uh, a service to the constituents that they represent think of one of the, um, what made you decide to run? I know you've been in the community. Well, let's go back to kind of tell them who you are. As we go through these, we know these names and we know people and their name on the ballot, mm -hmm. but kind of give a, give a little bit about your background, mm -hmm. um, your connection to Milwaukee. Um, so Milwaukee uh, was special to me because originally I was born and raised St. Thomas, the U.S. Virgin Islands. Yeah, my mom was in an abusive relationship. One morning, uh, I woke up and saw my dad, the knife to my mom's throat. And that was her breaking point where she was like, hey, we're getting out of this situation. We're leaving the islands. We're going to go to Milwaukee. My sister was here with her husband. Um, he was at MSOE. So that's how we ended up in Milwaukee. But Milwaukee has always been like a safe haven for me a place that accepted me as one of their own. Um, um, I went to Riverside University High School. I also attended John Burroughs Middle School for eighth grade. And through Riverside, I, I met Reggie Moore and Charlene Moore, uh, Urban Underground, where I credit them with finding my voice. Uh, you know, a lot of young black men and women as well, have these traumatic experiences that they live through on a daily basis, but they don't ever have the outlet to, to discuss, talk about these traumatic experiences that they hold in so much. And, you know, some of those effects were showing in high school. And I guess uh, Reggie Moore and Charlotte Moore saw that. And I decided to go to Urban on the ground where I met Robin Onyx and then Mujib Dyer in the poetry. Uh, writing session and there was like you know brother whatever it is that you're dealing with uh write it down and 
Don't recite it if you're not comfortable reciting it, but let you writing it down be your therapy. And when you are comfortable with reciting some of the things that you have been dealing with, let that be your, your healing. Um, I also served on the Bronzeville Advisory Committee. I was appointed by all the women in the Cox. I also sit on the Milwaukee County Arts Board. I was uh, appointed by Marcelia Nicholson. And uh, most people know me from the song Bow. It was phenomenal in the city. Uh, Milwaukee took that song all over the world and I was able to travel the world because of that foreign for our troops uh, overseas in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, a bunch of other places. And now using my platform and influence to do something greater than myself and, and really help transform the city, shift the energy in the city. Uh, Reggie Moore told me, uh, Ray, we're proud of you and everything that you're doing, but you can't change the room if you're not in the room. So this is me putting myself into the room. And just understanding the dynamics that the fourth automatic district has and what it means for not only the entire fourth automatic district, the amazing impact, if the correct leadership is in that seat, what impact it can have on the greater Milwaukee as well. Uh, we kind of answered this question, um, and I want to uh, I'll call this 414-444-5250. Um, you kind of answered it, but I want to uh, reiterate the question, why? Why did you run? Why are you running? Um, I just saw a need to shift the conditions that our people, everybody in the city, is dealing with. A lot of the things that people are tired of and has been going on for some time. And I think we need to relook at how politics is happening downtown in Milwaukee. And I am hoping to just be a breath of fresh air, some new energy, somebody that's bringing new vision, new ideas new ways of getting to the core root of the issues that's been troubling our city. And I just understand that all of the corporations that reside in the fourth automatic district, I want to be a liaison that is going to be fostering intentional conversations between corporations and communities and figuring out how we can really get to start um, maximizing these resources that could be very, very useful on the near West side and figure out how we also, um, impact the greater Milwaukee as a whole. All right. Call, we have a caller. Caller, go ahead. Yeah. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. Question for the alderman. Who is responsible for the city trash that's in the boulevard and if a light, like the red, green, and yellow light picture gets taken down by the cars? Is that an alderman issue? Um, I would assume that yes, the uh, constituents can report that to the alderman and then the alderman is then supposed to talk to the city departments. Uh, I would say that's probably DPW. That go ahead. It's all, it's so as so, an alderman, would it be something that you would put on your platform to make sure that you walk the neighborhood and see what's missing, how dirty it is, and do something about it in advance versus the residents? Absolutely. Because what I have is, you know, I call the alderman, the phone is always busy or... They're never returning calls. I just want to know what will separate you if that is responsibility of yours to make sure that that happens for cleaner Milwaukee. Yeah. Thank you a lot. No, thank you very much. And I appreciate that question. Uh, things that we've already been doing on a weekly basis is weekly neighborhood cleanups. And because we do see all of the trash in the city, uh, we teamed up with organizations like Black Man Build and uh, the Promise Keepers as well. And every Saturday and Sunday, we out there cleaning up and we try to get as much of the neighbors involved as well. Uh, we do think it needs to be a cultural shift as far as it comes down to the littering that has just become like normal in our city. So we're really trying to show folks like, hey, we're trying to create new healthy habits in the city of Milwaukee and using the fourth automatic district as a, a case study. This is what it's looked like when you're intentional about being out in the community on a weekly basis, not just when uh, it's too far gone. So we want to create and show that right away. And I want to do weekly neighborhood walks as well and really starting to get to what the concerns are of the folks. And that's the only way, in my opinion, that you can really get to the true needs of the concerns is if you're out there on a consistent basis and talking to the folks and really understanding what those needs are and listening to understand, not just listening to respond. 
So, yeah, I'll definitely look forward to being in these communities on a consistent basis. And as far as access to the alder, um, I do hear those stories all the time about folks not having access to their aldermans. But I, I'm somebody that wants to have every three weeks open office, whether that's in person or via Zoom. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, this is your time. But we, we, we communicate high level. So, <laughs> you know, no, this is your time. Um, one thing I want to clear up, um, you are on the ballot to be um, the alderman for this district. So I don't want anybody to blame you for anything that's happening or give you credit for anything that's happening. I'm just, right. it's just one of those things. I want to make sure that you are on the ballot. You are trying to be the alderman for that district. Right. Um, if, uh, and it, it's, it's, it's it, as a, there are so many different things that all their people do deal with, um, licensing and, and especially because it's a tier one city um which is different from other cities and where milwaukee is the only tier one city so they do, they're all their people are like I, I look at it as they're almost like mini mayors and so one of our other guests said it and i think that's the best way to put it is like the mini mayors of our district and they come together and then they they collaborate on what's best for the city as a common council but it is definitely um a big uh feat that you are going at let's take our next caller um go ahead caller uh, yes. good morning yeah mr nathan uh, good morning I normally don't do this but uh mr ray nitty yes sir right. yes sir uh uh right ray heo bowling I, that, that's that's good. That was that was real good. That was real good. Appreciate that, sir. I can really somewhat. <laughs> I'm thumb dumb, but I ain't thumb dumb. But uh, yeah, man. I wish I just want to tell people that uh, you hear me. This man is a good man. Uh, his opponent is tough. Keep it real. Uh, this man is a good man. I seen him do work when I was. Or you get all vacation or whatever. Call it what you want at the, the university, as they would say. They always be doing holy work. Yes, sir. And so on and so forth. And, uh, but I just want to say this man is a change you can trust. Man, I appreciate it. You know, he has a tough opponent. And, you know, I just want to put my community in the best position to succeed. And that's just that song, man. I love Mr. Nitty. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You know, as someone who actually lives in the fourth automatic district, oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is good. In that hall. This is good. Uh, yeah, just you know, what do you see as as the main, you know, like the top issue that's facing the fourth automatic district? I know, yeah, there's a lot of uh, different issues in different districts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where where I work up there, um, yeah, uh, you know, near Capitol Drive, they they have their own set of issues and. And in the fourth, we have our own set. But what do you think is? So oh, uh, that's an amazing question because, uh, as as you know, the district is very diverse. So you have a, a diverse group of me. Um, I would say on Highland Boulevard, right, Brother Alex on Thirty Third and Highland shared with me is like, yo, man, I really would love to see the reckless driving curb, and, and he wants to see more of those bump outs and the traffic slower measures in that area. On 27th and State, you will have folks say, hey, man, we really need to, to figure out more resources for folks suffering from substance abuse, alcohol abuse, mental health issues, and so forth. And then you have folks on the uh, 31st and Juno area that wants to see uh, more public safety measures in place. And then you also have folks on the Kilbourne and the McKinley area that wants to see things like more things for young people to do, more family-oriented things for them to be able to take advantage of. People want to see more restaurants that you could sit down and have a go with your family. And I think what's important is to do a intense, uh, a in-depth analysis of what all of these different needs are, what all of these different asks are, and then see about what corporations are already in this district as well and say, hey, how can we have some intense more conversations about getting to the bottom of some of these needs and concerns. So I would say it's a very, very um, 
diverse group of needs and concerns that folks would like to see. And I'm just trying to make sure I'm leaving no stone unturned and knocking on every door if possible. You know, sometimes everybody doesn't, isn't home at the same time. You just got to keep going back out there and keep, and then the trash as well. People do want to see the, the, the littering, uh, decreased. And, and as I state, they just really want to see more access to the, uh, leadership as well. And that's been something that has came up tremendously. Um, folks have said like the challenge to me, this is me being transparent with you all. Uh, folks have specifically said to me, how do I know if I support you? that this wouldn't be the last time that I see you or hear from you or even be able to talk to you. So those are some of the major concerns that folks um, are having as well. And not only are the, the neighborhood concerns, but they're concerned that, oh, if we support you, will you be around? Will we have access to you? And uh, those are some of the things. <laughs> Please join Wisconsin Voices every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. We will be focusing on community partnerships, voter education, and long-term collective impact for all Wisconsinites. You're listening to Wisconsin Voices Be A Voice Radio. Follow us at B A W I Voice and learn more at WisconsinVoices.org. The three pillars of Wisconsin Voices are protecting democracy, teaching advocacy, and building community. Learn more about Wisconsin Voices and our partners at wisconsinvoices.org. Stay up to date on our community events page and get involved by visiting our donation page. We are uh, going into, this series has been eye-opening, just being able to catch so many of the candidates that have graced us with their presence and and letting the community know who they are. We have another candidate. Well, she is a sitting alderman now. I mean, a uh, su- county supervisor uh, in the 18th, I believe. And uh, introduce yourself. Hey there, um, I'm Deanna Alexander. I'm the current county supervisor for the 18th district of Northwest side of Milwaukee. That's roughly Timberman Airport area and northward to the county line. And uh, the old North Ridge Wall area, uh, and then west to the county line. And I'm the current supervisor as well as running for re-election. Thanks for having me today. And thank you for having We always ask, this is the first question we ask everybody. If they listen to our show, they know it. They know it's coming. If they don't know it's coming, they're not listening to our show. Right. Um, what does a county supervisor do? Uh very good question. I get asked that a lot in the community. Um, even as you know, out campaigning, a lot of people say, "I think I support you. I think I know you." But what does the job entail? Um, if we think about the different branches of government, your executive branch is basically the doers, like your president or your governor or your county executive, and then you have, of course, your judicial branch for the courts. You have your legislative branch. And when you think about it at the federal level, you've got Congress making laws. When you think about it at the state level, you've got state assemblymen and senators, they are making laws. At the county level, your legislative branch of government is your county board of supervisors. So the fast answer is we make policy, but we also serve as uh, sort of voices for our constituents that may be having a concern about how county government is run, something's going wrong, need a new policy, a new plan a new director and we get involved at that level as well. Um, and on a side note, if you would like to know that, we are doing our Wisconsin Voice Civics 101 class. That is something that we do um, present in our Civics 101 class. We're doing it on Wednesday um, at Youthful Pathway from 6 to 8. Go on the website, click on it, sign up for it. And uh, we give you all that information. We do a two-hour, like, kind of power session, which is exactly what you just talked about. So Mm -hmm. um, you have been a super, we we like to go on, who are you? What are you, you know, what your person is? And then we'll go in a little bit. You've been here a while. Um, Who are you? Like, who is Deanna Alexander? Well, thank you. Good question. I think... uh, we all continue to evolve over time, and I am no exception. 
reaction to that. So before I fully dive into that, let me have a little bit of time layout. May. Yeah, it's it's okay. about who you are, you know, where you come from, where you're from. It, this is your time to kind of introduce yourself. Awesome. Thank you. So um, I uh, have been a uh, county supervisor for about 10 of the last 12 years. I put it that way because I came into office in 2012. I left uh, in 2020 to honor a term limit oath. So I was not supervisor for two years. And then I was reelected in 2022. And I think that some of the voters know me as um, uh, is a little bit of a different person back then because my outlook on politics has certainly changed over the years and um, what is good for our county and how this should be done. Um, and so while I am um, uh, consistent with my core beliefs and who I am as a person, my way of working has changed over the years. And that's that's really important for voters to know as they continue to get to know it. Um, so I, I was raised in Southeast Wisconsin. My mom was a registered nurse and my dad was a car salesman. Um, when I was a kid, um, my dad got involved in drugs and was arrested for allegedly selling cocaine and he went to prison. And so a big part of my childhood was spending every Saturday at Wapan or whichever place they transferred to him to, to go with my mom to visit my dad in jail. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that as part of my upbringing because I think that there's a lot of people out there who have these types of issues in their family, have to deal with it. And sometimes when you're in that situation, you feel like the people in power or the people in positions can't relate. And I want people to know that I have had that life experience. So, um, so dealing with, the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but dealing with the issues with the, the county jails and, and different aspects of it, you feel like you bring a, like, not a personal, but uh, you can look at it and see stakes for the families. I, I can. I know what it's like to be in second grade, third grade, eighth grade and have an incarcerated parent. Not only the the loss of the parent in the household and seeing what my mom had to do to keep things moving in the right direction as practically a sick old mom with her husband incarcerated um, and then taking care of children, but also um, I think that because of that experience, I became a wildly independent person growing up in a household where mom was always working and dad was gone. And I think that um, even though I'm a person that sits at these tables and has to make decisions when we take votes about uh, policy for the jail or, you know, is a new facility being built? What will we have? What will we not have? Uh, et cetera. I, I have to make decisions that are overall what is the best for the county. I represent the voice of the district to that question, but also I have that personal experience of I know what it's like to not know when is your loved one getting released or how come you've been waiting for two hours for a visitation or whatever the thing. Mm -hmm. So I take a lot of that type of personal experience that might work with me and really just try to have a lot of perspective for where people are coming from and try to meet people where they're at. You, you served under three county supervisors then. County exec. At county exec. Was, were you under Scott Walker as well? Um, I or did you just get in when Chris Abley was county exec? I've uh, served with Chris Abley um, and, and Crowley. Right. So, um, so you were not on the board? When, okay, I thought you were. I'm, I'm giving you a little more uh, uh, experience than you know. Um, what do you want to see? What are like your three kind of benchmarks? for the district or what do you want to see um, you work on? Because, you know, you have something, this is not an individual thing, but some of the things that you would like to see that would help your particular district. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I'll add a little bit more context as well. So um, when I originally ran for office, I think that a lot of the things that people were talking about around town in regards to the county the pension scandal was still a big hot topic. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of concern about that. And uh, all eyes were on the state. So I originally came into the office as a county supervisor around the time of the Scott Walker recalls. Right. 
So um, that was a very different political environment than things are today. Um, I, I came in really being agnostic to politics at the time. I probably couldn't have told you the difference between Democrat or Republican positions. Um, and uh, I really just wanted to say, hey, I'm a homeowner. I'm a mom. You know, I'm a taxpayer. I have a bachelor's degree in accounting. I have the education and government work experience. But I think I can do a good job in this county supervisor role. Um, as I dove into running that campaign, I found that the waters of politics are, are choppier and, and much more dangerous than you might be led to believe running for nonpartisan office. And you had to learn to sink or swim, fight for your life, and, you know, do it in, in the most upright manner possible. Um, so when I came into office at that time, um, I think that we had just a very different focus on what the community was looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, case in point, when I would knock doors, people would say, how do we know you just don't want to get in on the pension scandal? And that was a big right. conversational topic. Today, when I knock on doors through the neighborhoods and, you know, the past couple of elections, it's a little bit different. People seem to be very concerned um, about crime and safety issues. They're tired of homes being broken into, cars being rifled through. Uh, things being stolen. So uh, making sure that neighborhoods are safe is absolutely a top concern. Um, making sure that traffic is safe is a top concern. Um, there's lots of stolen cars, hit and run accidents, things like that. Um, and then I think that taxes are a concern for people. Um, a lot of people can't afford continuous tax increases. While I won't take a pledge to never raise taxes because I I hope if the voters elect me, they want me to make an informed decision on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, I'm not one of those people that says, let's do this and this and this and this program and then overload ourselves with programs and spending. And then we have to raise your taxes, but we have a little show for what happened. Um, it's, uh, if we do have to, we, we like, I have to give you a little bit of credit um, the, how you got back in office, you, you, gave, <laughs> you know, you um, didn't run for your seat and, and someone else got in. And then you did a write-in campaign to get your, your seat back. So I have to give you kudos and props for that. Thank you very much. Yes. So um, I took a term limit oath. Might have been a foolish thing to do at the time, but I thought as a comrade of politics a decade ago that it was the right thing to do at the time. Um, so when my eight years came around, um, I declined to run for re-election. A lot of people talked to me and said, oh, Deanna, you're one of the good ones. You do a good job, Stacey. And I said, I think for exactly that reason, all hate line politicians. That's why politicians get a bad name. Why would I consciously say, well, I made this promise, but uh, it doesn't mean anything now. Even if, even if I know that staying would be best for the community, I would like to do a capable blah, blah, blah. I have to leave to prove a point. I always, I never tell people who I'm voting because I'll say I'm leaning this way because if you hear some information and you hear something that's in a committee or somebody testify and you end up changing your mind, then all of a sudden you're a liar. So I kind of get that. That's really right. smart. Yeah. You, you only say what you're leaning towards or, and you're saying that you made an oath when you first started and you wanted to, to, uh, wanted to honor that to honor that. and even if people didn't know about the oath or didn't remember it i thought it was important to show that i operate with integrity if you call me out you call me on the floor uh chances are i'm going to defend myself or ad admit for there's error and so that was a situation that i never ever ever wanted to be someone that could say you promised this in writing to us to the community you know Paul. so i left uh mr russell goodwin came into office at that time unopposed was elected uh he and I had a decent working relationship. And as the outgoing supervisor, I said, good luck to you. Congratulations. Do a rock star job. I care if you need me. If there's any way I can be of service, let me know. And uh, the second part of my message to him was, I hope you do a great job. If you don't, and something changes, and it's not going the way that it should, I'll be back. <laughs> Please don't make me do that. Um, so fast forward two years later, uh, I saw enough things uh, going on or not going on that uh, the 
decided to uh, see if the voters would have me back. And I let people know I have filled the oath. Somebody else in the community came up. Would you like them to continue or shall I return? And ran a writing campaign. The voters asked me to come back. So we're at the end of that term now. And uh, things have, have gone well. Um, I think that the county is in different ways moving in the right direction. Sometimes it doesn't always feel that way, but uh, we, we are moving in the right direction and um, I'm glad to be back and I hope the voters will consider me again to continue serving. Um, last, uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, if anybody has a question, 414-444-5250. Um, there is, uh, I guess, as we talk about county which is transit which is parks which is you know um i i call them the the um quality of life issues um what is the one thing in your next term you would really like to work on not necessarily for your district but in general like something that you would really like to see happen thank you um i've worked on a lot of things over the years that I'll call the unsexy things. A lot of times I'm not the gal you see on the six o'clock news. I'm not always at the podium saying, look, that's a great thing I did or legislation I wrote, all that. Um, you know, that that has its time and its place, but that's usually not uh not my place. And um I have one that is cooking in the kitchen right now, but I'm gonna be very happy to merge the working on things behind the scenes to make government work right with the public announcements that we can get there. But the, the quick overview is that it would not be just for my district. It would affect the whole county. I am in talks with the county executive uh, and hoping to enter into talks with the state about taking the county's policy that there's no wrong door. Like if you call the county for assistance, we're supposed to be getting you to the right door, not just saying, sorry, that's not our department, or sorry, right. call them right. instead. How do we get you in the right door? Um, I want to find a way to integrate a lot of these services so that families can have more of a one-stop shop, whether they're trying to get food share or how do I get a zoo pass or what do I do about my incarcerated family member that's not getting their medication or whatever. Something like the 211 or the city uh, with the number for the city. I think a they, little bit yeah. like 211. Right. People can talk to a live person in the office and get for their direct guidance on social work. Well, thank you. Expressed on this show do not reflect that of the staff and management of WNOV and W293CX 106.5 FM Courier Communications Milwaukee, but are the sole comments of the host and guest of this particular show. The views and opinions expressed in this program do not reflect those of Wisconsin Voices. Views and opinions expressed by hosts and guests are their own, and their appearance on the program do not imply any endorsement or representation by Wisconsin Voices. Thank you for listening to Be a Voice with Wisconsin Voices. Be a voice. 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 Visit wisconsinvoices.org. Visit wisconsinvoices.org. Visit wisconsinvoices.org. And learn more on how to be a voice with Wisconsin Voices.